In this tutorial, we're going to talk about covariance. I'm going to compare covariance to salt. Salt is in a lot of things we eat, not just the obvious things like pretzels, but also in a lot of sweet baked goods. A lot of things just don't taste right unless there's at least a little bit of salt in there. And yet, I've never seen anybody eat just handfuls of salt all by itself. Likewise, although covariance is in a lot of different statistical analyses, nobody's terribly interested in covariance all by itself. That is, it's a means to an end, but covariance is rarely used as an end product. Probably the reason for this is that covariance is an unstandardized measure of association. Because it's an unstandardized measure of association, if I say the covariance between x and y is 32, you don't know if that's a big relationship, a small relationship, unless you know a little bit about those measures, specifically what their standard deviation is. As you might guess from the name, covariance is closely related to variance. As you'll recall from a previous tutorial, variance is the expected value of deviations squared. That is, we have some variable x, and from each score in x we subtract the mean of x. This gives us a deviation. The deviation is squared, and then we take the expected value of this, that is, the average squared deviation. The symbol for variance is sigma squared. Sigma is the standard deviation. Standard deviation squared is variance. I'm going to show a picture of what variance might look like in a scatter plot, and then I'll show how this is related to covariance. So here we have a distribution. We'll call the variable x. The mean of this sample is about right here, and it's about 9.52. Each of these dots is some distance from the mean. That is, each of these dots has a deviation. This dot here differs by this much from the mean. If this distance is squared, the squared deviation will equal the area of this square. Not all deviations are positive. This dot here has a deviation that is negative. But if we square a negative number, we get a positive number. So this area of this square represents a positive number. For each dot, we can make a deviation and a squared deviation, like so. We can even color code these squares, like so, such that green squares are small and red ones are larger. Variance is the average size of all of these squares. In this sample, the average square is this size here. The length of that square is the standard deviation, s sub x is the standard deviation of the sample. In this case it happens to be 2.83. 2.83 squared is the variance of this sample. So this is a way of thinking about variance, and I'll show that it's also a way of thinking about covariance with a bit of a twist. So here's our formula for variance, is the expected value of the deviation squared. I'm going to take each deviation here, since there are two of them, and separate them out like this. So here's the deviation for x, here's another one. And now I'm going to replace this x and this mean of x with y and the mean of y, like so. So we still have a deviation for x here, but I replaced the deviation for x with a different variable. So y minus its own mean is the deviation of y from the mean. Instead of having the standard deviation of x squared, what we have now is the covariance between x and y. In a sense, it's the standard deviation of the product of x and y. In fact, an alternate name for covariance could very well be the standard product. That isn't the name, but they could have named it that. What covariance represents is the average product of the deviations of x and y. This times this, how big is it on average? If you're like me, a formula may not be very informative until you see it in a picture too. So I'm going to show a scatter plot depicting the relationship between x and y. So here's x on the x-axis, and fittingly y is on the y-axis. Each point represents a pair of numbers. Now if you've taken a statistics course, you may have seen scatter plots like this, and you may have seen that statisticians like to draw ellipses around them showing the relationship between x and y. And if you can fit a lot of these points within a very skinny ellipse, then we would say that x and y are highly related. 
or more technically, they have a strong linear relationship, or even more technically, we could say that x and y are strongly correlated. But in truth, we're not actually seeing a picture of correlation here. We are seeing a picture of covariance, except that it's hidden. The ellipse is centered on this point here. It's the point where the mean of x meets the mean of y. In this case, the means are 9.52 and 34. Let's remove the ellipse and think about this relationship in a slightly different way. Let's show the deviation of x and the deviation of y of just one point, this one right here. So this distance from here to here is this point's deviation from the mean of y. So this distance or the one at the top, they're both the same distance. This distance from here to here, or from here to here, is the deviation of this point from the mean of y. The product of these deviations will equal the area of this rectangle. Because both deviations are positive, the area of this rectangle is also positive. But that's not always the case. For example, this point here has a negative deviation on x and a positive deviation of y. And so when you multiply those two numbers, you will get a negative number. So in this quadrant, all of the points, when you multiply their deviations, you will get negative products. That's also true in this quadrant here, because you have a positive deviation for x and a negative deviation for y. A positive times a negative is a negative number. In this quadrant, however, you get two negative deviations. And when you multiply two negatives, you get a positive number. Let's draw rectangles for every point in the distribution. And we can add color to make the illustration a little bit more vivid. So the green rectangles here and here represent products that are small and positive. The red ones are large and positive. The blue rectangles are small negative products, and the violet ones are larger negative products. So where's covariance? Well, covariance is the average size of all of these rectangles. If we were to add up all of the areas of these rectangles, keep in mind that some of them are negative, and then average those areas, what we'll get is covariance. The size of this rectangle here represents the covariance of this particular sample. It happens to be about 8.43. Now, if you're thinking that this doesn't look like the average size of the rectangles, they seem bigger to you, remember that we have negative areas here. And also, a lot of these rectangles are very small. They're just bunched close together. If there were a negative relationship between x and y, the average covariance would be negative. And we could depict that with a rectangle that is in one of the negative quadrants. If you're trying to calculate covariance and you have a whole population, you can use this formula here. You take each x and each y, you subtract their respective means, you multiply those deviations, add them up, and divide by the number of pairs of scores. If you have a sample, which is much more likely, if you use this formula, on average, your estimate of the covariance will be a little bit too small. One of the reasons for this is that when you sample from a population, the sample is less likely to contain the really extreme scores. And so if you use this formula, you'll be off by a certain amount. To correct for that bias that this formula has, you'll divide by n minus 1 instead of just by n. It turns out that this correction makes this estimate unbiased. There's a very special case of covariance. When your variables are unstandardized, covariance is calculated like this. But if you standardize your variables first, the covariance will equal a very special number. So the way to standardize a variable is that you divide each deviation by the standard deviation. So we did that in x and we did that in y because we divided by the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y on this side of the equation. We have to do so on this side of the equation too. This expression here represents a z-score for the x variable and this expression is a z-score for the y variable, like so. 
So this becomes this, this becomes this. The expected value of the product of z-scores is so important that it has its own name. It's the correlation coefficient. You might be used to the correlation coefficient having a Roman letter R, and that is the appropriate letter when you're talking about a sample. When you're talking about the population, we use the Greek letter Rho. Rho is the Greek R, and it looks like a P. It's a little bit confusing, but it is not a P, it is a Rho. It represents the correlation between X and Y. Correlation is a standardized measure of association. When I say that two variables have a correlation of 0.5, that has a very specific meaning. If I say that the covariance is 0.5, that could mean a very strong relationship, or it could mean a very weak relationship. You would need to know what the standard deviations are first. So here's the formula for correlation. We take the covariance and divide by the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y. If we multiply by the denominator on both sides of this equation, we get this equation, which is a nice way of calculating covariance if you know the correlation and the two standard deviations of the variables.